welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to talk about the importance of serving and not just serving, but with the right attitude and the willingness to serve, even when it costs us something. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of that SundaySchoolGirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for Sunday, January 27th. Well, if your notifications are set, this is a Sunday surprise for you, an early upload of next week's video. Now, I'm just like a whole lot of you. I've got this long list of things that I want to accomplish in 2019 and areas that I want to be better, and uploading earlier in the week is on my list. Now, I'm not going to promise every Sunday, but for this week, let's just celebrate that we have the entire week together to be prepared for next week's class. If you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. This is the most watched, the most thumbs up, liked, and the most engaged community on YouTube, and I am happy that you're here. I know that you're going to be blessed. Do me a favor, make sure that you have clicked the subscribe button down below. That's going to get you connected. And if you click the notifications bell, that will ensure that you are getting an email as soon as content is released on this channel. In fact, everyone, I'm gonna also ask you this. If this video is helpful to you, if you've enjoyed the content, please don't forget to click that thumbs up button. We've got a goal of a thousand likes a week, and that's easy to do in a community that's this awesome. So please give us a thumbs up like if you've enjoyed this video. It's kind of like saying amen. We've got an awesome, awesome lesson this week. But before we jump into it, if you follow my social media, you already know what I'm about to share. But just in case you missed it, I've been hinting around for a couple of weeks that it was coming. I was going to tell you. And last night I showed a picture that my bag was packed for Sunday school, for church. I was ready because the new tote bags are available. There are new items in the new TSSG store on Etsy. If you go to Etsy.com and type in TSSG in the search box, you're going to hit the store. And this is the signature tote. Pull that back there. It's a canvas tote bag, very roomy, nice gusset at the bottom. And this is the medium bag. I took it today. I had my commentary. Uh, my shoes were in here. I have a pouch that I had in, some other things. I mean, like it, it holds a lot of stuff, but there are three sizes out there and there are actually two collections. So this is the signature collection. There is another collection I think you will enjoy, it has some new artwork that is called the Dream Collection, but check those out. And I know that I am often accused of forgetting the men, but men, if you're into your sock game, there is something in the Etsy store for you. So check it out. Um, inside of my bag, I also today carried, these are available as well. This is just a pouch. I love pouches. I have them in my purse. I have them in my backpack. I have them in my car. They just, you know, they hold some of anything. So this one is great for pencils or if you take like small makeup in your purse or whatever. This is the one I actually carried today in my bag. And this is the large, um, the large T, I believe it's called the T shaped tote. But I like it because it's got the wider bottom. I had my Bible inside. I also had just pens, pencils, highlighters. Like I'm a nerd like that. I had all of this with me in my bag for church today. But again, these items are in the store. Take a look at it. I'd love your feedback. And hey, order something great and show your love for Sunday school. That's what these items are all about. Again, we have a wonderful lesson this week. Do me a favor, make sure that you've got your TSSG notes downloaded. The link is below if you need it, that you've got your Bibles, your commentaries, your publisher's books, your pens and highlighters, whatever it is that you come to study with. It is time for us to get into this lesson. Our lesson title is Devote All to Christ. The Bible basis is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The Bible truth. Paul commends the example of Christ who humbly emptied himself in order to serve God and others through his sacrifice. Our memory verse is verse three, and the lesson aim is that we will analyze the work of Christ in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, follow Christ's example of humility and sacrifice, and grow in our ability to place the needs of others before our own. We continue this week in the book of Philippians, moving to chapter two. 
As I was preparing this week's lesson, I reflected on my very first professional assignment. In my junior and senior years of high school, I participated in a professional readiness program, a preparatory program of sorts. And in my senior year, I was selected as an intern to participate in a four-year internship with Walmart Stores Incorporated. Here's what I loved about Walmart. As a customer, you could expect consistency in your shopping experience. That meant that whether I walked in a store in Mississippi, Texas, Kansas, New York, Minnesota, I expected the same level of superior service, a good selection of product, even if it was tweaked a little bit for some regional preferences. But overall, there was something that was uniform about the experience. The owner, the founder at the time, Mr. Sam Walton, was still living when I was an intern. And there was a phrase that became a part of the Walmart culture when he was asked, what is it that makes your stores special? What is it that makes them unique? His answer was this, our people make the difference. Our people make the difference. There's absolutely no limit to what plain, ordinary working people can accomplish if they're given the opportunity and the encouragement and the incentive to do their best. That again is from Mr. Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart Stores Incorporated. Our people make the difference. And that's what I hear over and over again is that people make the difference. That seems to be a lot of the message that Paul is conveying as he writes to this church at Philippi. I gave you extensive background notes on this church last week. So if you've missed those, you should go back and download the notes or pause right now and just go back and pick up last week's lesson, even for the background. We know now that our writer is Paul. Again, he's writing to this sort of startup church back in Philippi. He's the pastor. He's gone on now. He's writing to them actually from a Roman prison. But what we learned is that he loved them and they loved him. This letter that he's written is a letter of thanks. It is a letter of assurance, of encouragement. And now there's some instruction in here. In last week's lesson, in verses 1 through 11, we saw the prayer of Paul. We learned that his mind, his heart, his prayers, five specific things were with this particular church. And verses 12 through the end, Paul talked about his own situation. And we saw his perspective on his own situation. So in chapter two, we've got to get a little bit grounded in what he's addressing now. He seems to be addressing what is it that's keeping the church from working together in its most ideal way? Why are you not operating at your peak performance? His answer was, it was the people. It was their lack of ability to work together in unity. They were experiencing persecution and they were looking to blame the outside for everything that was wrong on the inside. They were concerned about the persecution, but Paul says, that's not your real issue. And he very much acts like James did two weeks ago when he turns this mirror to say, it's not the people on the outside that you need to worry about. There is an internal problem that you've got to focus on. So as opposed to being concerned about attacks on the outside, be concerned about the things on the inside that are breaking down this organization. Paul expressed what he wants from them the most. What he wants most is for them to conduct themselves in a manner that is worthy of Jesus Christ. Remember, the theme of this book is joy. We see joy mentioned more than 10 times in this letter. And he's still talking about joy inside of difficulty. Last week, it was joy inside of his own difficulty. This week, there is joy even inside of persecution from the outside. And he talks about that. Now, our printed text begins in chapter two, but it's going to be important that you go back and look at chapter one and read verses 27 through 30. Again, the church is being persecuted by the outside world. The world has their own ideas, their own agendas, their own desires. And Paul is explaining that the world persecutes them because they're only concerned about the things that are important to them. They are driven by no, they're driven to persecute the church because they know that those two worlds are never going to align with each other. 
But again, he's telling them that's not your focus. You've got to keep your mind on what's important. You can't be like them. You can't act or react like them. You have to live differently. I thought about that as well. There were times that there are times even now that I have situations and there are ways that I want to react and things that I want to say. But I literally have a couple of folks in my life who remind me, you can't respond like everybody else. And that's what Paul is saying, is that you have to respond and you have to live differently. But what you've got to do is get on the same page. You all have got to be unified if you're going to be successful. Look specifically at chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. There are some translations that say stand or that you live in a way that is worthy of the gospel. That's his big message, that you've got to live in a way that's worthy of this gospel that we preach. The focus is unity. And I underlined or highlighted these words. He wanted them to stand in unity, firmly in unity. That meant working together. And what was the evidence of this unity? And here's where this gets to be important for our printed text. They were to stand with one mind, one spirit one mind working together. Remember that one spirit, one mind working together. So how is unity achieved? Again, this is where he turns and makes this a very individual conversation. This is about individual living. It's how we reflect the heart of God that makes us different. How are we living selflessly? What is it? What does that look like? And how do we recognize it? And what does it make us do? So chapter two, starting at verse one, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels of mercies, verse two, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. This starts as a conclusory statement. It's a therefore idea. He's coming off of what I just told you to pay attention to in verses 27 through 30. That's a premise. And he says pretty much since this is this this exists, this is a state of information as a result. Therefore, here's the conclusion. He's making a conclusion based on what has already been said. He's told them how they are to live live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in light of all that he said now, he's got something that he wants them to consider. Those are the ideas that he shares in the following passage. He gives this set of four conditional clauses, if then statements, if this be true, then this should happen as a result of it. And we should think about this not in the scope of if being an option. This is not a choice, but substitute the word if, if you use King James for since or because. And here are the statements. Since or because there is consolation in your position in Christ. How does that happen? Uh, They have been encouraged in Christ. They know what they have been given. They know the forgiveness they've been given. So since you received that in Christ, as a result of what you understand about Christ, this should make you more open and accepting. Take a look at Ephesians chapter one, verse three. The second thing is since or because his love, the love of Christ has comforted you. They've experienced the love and the grace of God, the adoption as sons. The third thing is since or because you have fellowship with the spirit, having the spirit of God constantly with them, talking about their connection, their relationship, the fact that the spirit of God empowered them and since or because you have received mercy. Since all of these things have happened for you, I need you to do something. Verse two is a call to unity. He says, make my joy complete. In other words, I'm not there with you, but here's what you can do to make me comfortable. Make me comfortable that you're living in the full blessings of God. How are you to do this? Now, again, you've got to figure out that at this point, he's addressing a problem. Paul's joy is not complete because he knows the church has issues. They are lacking in some way. Think about our lesson from, I believe it was January 13th, that examination in James. He asked them a question. 
What is it? What is it that keeps you off from being unified? What is it that causes you to fight or to quarrel? The answer was not everything on the outside. The answer was the individual. And again, that is what Paul is doing. He's speaking in that same way. He's taking that turn. He's looking internally. This is what I want you to do. It would have been easy for him to address the external issues, but this is what I want you to do. And it will complete my joy if you focus on the inside and fix it. So we have these if-then statements. If these things are true, then there should be a reaction. Here's what you are to do. What are we to do? If these things are true, and by the way, they are, you've got to do something about it. Note his writing. These are not suggestions. These are not options. He writes as a commandment to just do it. What is it? Live differently as a result of what you know to be true. Complete my joy by doing the things that are evidence of walking in a manner worthy of Christ. I told you that we were going to need chapter 1, verse 27. What are those things that are to fulfill his joy? To be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. That language is carried from 127. The same mind. Let's talk about that. That doesn't mean that we're all identical, that we walk around in the same clothes, that we all think the same thing and say the same thing. It doesn't mean that we don't have opinions or mental processes, but what it speaks to is the same core values, that we're anchored in the same love and the same attitude, and that we have the same outlook as Christ. Uh, look at St. John chapter 17, verse 21. Christ prayed that the church would be one, that we would be one. The second thing was to have the same love, and that is the love for each other, just as they've experienced the love of God. St. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, not by your bumper stickers, not by your t-shirts, but by the love that you have for one another. He was explaining that the church is to be defined by our love. The third thing is full accord, being one just like the spirit had become one. One with them. What did that mean? It meant having a common purpose or a common focus, not worried about what was on the outside, but keeping their eyes focused on their assignment, which was the Great Commission to go into all the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then again, this repetition of having one mind. Now, my wow here was that the threat of the unity of the church was not on the outside. It wasn't those that were persecuting, but it was definitely an inside job. In verse three, he's explaining that nothing should be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. In chapter one, Paul gives this perspective on how he viewed his own situation. Now he shares how each of us should have the view of our own selves, and views of other people. Here's the big message that he's saying. This is not about you. Just like his situation, his being in prison, he was so clear it was not about him. It was an opportunity for this big stage to be prepared and presented for the gospel to go forward. So he's explaining that life is not all about you. And that's fairly counterintuitive. I was thinking about phrases and songs that we hear now. You know, I'm living my best life and living my life like it's gold. And those are attitudes that really focus on me. And if we're not careful, they keep us so wrapped up in ourselves that we forget the world around us. And so this message kind of shook their whole theology. Verse three is a warning against being selfish. Verses 3b and 4 are called to be humble and to have a love that is selfless. I had to create a chart. You all know that I'm a visual learner. Um, and he speaks to them in the form of two don'ts and a do. Thought about the show what not to wear. Here's what you don't want to do. Here's one thing to do. He talks about three different areas. The first is this attitude of selfishness. He's saying, don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. Don't be arrogant. That is an, a call to watch our attitudes. That is part of the real threat is attitude. When we live selfishly, he was talking to them about pursuing concerns and selfish ambitions that were self 
focused. Those who only looked out for number one, me, myself, and I, me, my four, and no more. He's saying to them, don't live in a way that's selfish. And if you think about selfish attitudes, they are learned and adopted very early. Think about babies. If they have something in their hands, it is what? Mine. If you put it down and I want it, it's mine. If it's in your hand and I want it, the answer is mine. If you saw it first, but you touched it to a baby, it's still mine. And we have adopted some of those attitudes very early in life and they carry on. Even now, look at a culture that is so ingrained, even with the idea of selfies. Look at how many selfies all of us are guilty of putting up and there's nothing wrong with those things as long as we keep it in perspective and you've got to know that there is a world outside of selfie nation he explains that model behavior is to have the mind of christ what is that it's an attitude of humility it's being able to identify prideful areas inside of ourselves and address them it's not behaving in ways that are full of entitlement and that does not mean to think less of ourselves, but it means to think of ourselves less. Not to think less of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less. The second thing is don't be conceited. Don't be conceited. The King James word is vainglory, having an exaggerated idea of our own importance. You are not that wonderful. That's what he's explaining, that none of us, we're just not that wonderful. And living in pride is destructive. The Bible tells us that uh, destruction comes to those who have haughty spirits, high-minded. Pride comes before a fall. Those are dangerous places to be. So the reflection is to really think about Jesus and how he lived. And we're going to see that. Even think about, you know, so many people walk in the room and they want the celebration and they want the applause. But that's not even how Jesus entered the room. When he was born, he didn't come in celebration and surprise, celebration and awe and wonder. He came so humbly, born in a stable, wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, in an area where there was no room for him. And so we've got to watch attitudes of conceit. Don't just look out for the interests of ourselves, but look out for others. And scripture reference there is Galatians 2. So those are the two don'ts. Don't be selfish. Don't be conceited. But do this. Do keep the thoughts of yourself low and do esteem others. Again, very counterintuitive in a self-esteem, self-confident, independent kind of world. But we've got to be careful to keep thoughts of ourselves under control. Keep them low, but instead treat others better than we do ourselves. Lift others. Treat them as more significant, more valuable. Look out for the needs of others. It doesn't mean to neglect yourself but it means to look out for the needs of others. Verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verses five through eight, give us this model in Christ for humility and being selfless. Look back at verse two. It talked about the mind that we are to have. This is the same mind and the same attitude as Christ. And what he's saying is that we've got to not align ourselves with the mindset of the world, but rather align our mindset with the mind of Christ. And what is the mind of Christ? He lays that out in verses six and seven. Uh, look again at verse one. He talks about a mind of love, love and a humble disposition, serving others at the sacrifice of ourselves. That's what he lays out. And then he gives us this example. We see a model in Christ. Why do we do this? Why is it necessary for us to live in this way? First of all, keep in mind the background that we read, that there was already disunity in the world. The world lives this way, but he's reminding them that you are not the world. You've got to be different. And here is the best role model that we have. The role model is Christ. You should live this way because Jesus himself operated in this way. He operated in love. Look at God the Father. His love was so great that he gave his only son. What a selfless and sacrificial thing to give up the son that he loved, that whoever would believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
The second thing that we see inside of Christ is his humble disposition. Think about this. Jesus Christ is in heaven with his father. He's in heaven. He's got everything. He's got every comfort. He's got every advantage, every privilege. And he gave all of that up to come to earth in human form for you and for me, for our sins. He he himself was God. He's same worth and same worthiness as his father, equal to God. Yet he did not use that as a reason not to make a sacrifice. He set aside every privilege that he had, every advantage that he had for the benefit of others. He served others at the sacrifice of himself. Jesus himself was not selfish. His willingness wasn't just an idea. It wasn't a good feeling. It wasn't an attitude, but it became an action. The scripture tells us this, that he emptied himself. In other words, he poured himself out. He took on the form of a servant through, again, this humble birth. He comes as a baby. He didn't come as this warring military soldier, but he comes as a baby, a baby who had to put himself in a position to depend on others for his very life, to be fed, to be changed. He comes as a suffering servant, subject to the will of his father. Considering again who he truly was, he walked among men and people saw him and yet did not understand the fullness of his glory. He wasn't lauded by titles. They didn't roll out carpet wherever he went. In fact, he was so common that a lot of people, most people saw him as just a regular humble guy. In fact, he was referred to as son by just a man. They said, isn't that he's just Joseph's son? And he served, and yet his service to us, his service to the world, cost him everything, including his life. He endured torture and humiliation on the cross. He laid down his life. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man who would lay down his life for friends. And he did this all not for himself. He was already comfortable, but he did it for us. He took punishment and shame, which should have been ours. So the picture that Paul lays out here is the demonstration of the humility of Christ. And he is our true role model. And what Paul says is that what I've laid out to you is not a stretch. In corporate America, they call it a stretch objective. You have kind of your base objectives that you want to meet. And then you may uh, create two or three things that are kind of your pie in the sky. And it'd be really great if you hit them. But if you don't, no one holds it against you. Paul is saying this is not a stretch objective. It's not too much to ask. And it should be comforting to live. Go back to verse one, look for the word comfort. It should be comforting to live in the way that Christ lived. Verses nine through 11 explain to us that the lowest place, being in the lowest place, actually put Jesus in the highest place. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He is again illustrating that Christ is our example of humility. And he shows us the results of the way that Christ lived. The results were he lived low, but it esteemed him. His father esteemed him as a result. In other words, the road to being exalted is the path of humility. In Matthew 23 and 12, it says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so this is what it means for us to devote all to Christ. And I took time, I'm a dictionary reader, you all know that, and I hope that you'll look those words up, that we will be challenged to devote or to give all of our time, all of our resources, holding nothing back in reserve for the service of Christ. And we'll give up all, again, not holding back any little piece that we want to save for ourselves, but being willing to serve him, even if it costs us. This is our lesson. Here are my key learnings from this week. The first is that we should be reminded of the importance of unity. As Paul writes, unity is part of the joy experience. And how do we become unified? 
You've got to work on you. Remember, it is people who make the difference. You make the difference. I make the difference. But we only make the difference when each of us focuses and does the internal work to be the best person in the places that we live, work, and serve. The second is that we must be willing to surrender our privileges, possessions, status, and titles to serve others. We've got to look out for the interests of others. Be willing to put ourselves in their shoes to discover their true needs. There is a cost of serving and we must be willing to serve even when it costs us something. And it may cost, cost doesn't always mean money. It may cost you some time. It may cost you some talent. It may cost you a listening ear, but we must be willing to serve even when it costs. We've got to become servants, willing to embrace the experience of Christ. Remembering that a willingness to serve isn't just an idea or an attitude or a good feeling, but it must be an action. And we must be like Jesus and be willing to lay down the things that are convenient to us and be reminded that the way up is through the road of humility. And that means keeping ourselves down. Again, this is the lesson for this week. I cannot wait to hear what you get from the lesson. So as always, as you develop your notes, leave me notes down below so that I can add your notes to my notes. When we get to class next week, we will all have bomb notes and we're going to have a great week in Sunday school. Again, everyone have a fantastic week. I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.